gentlemen, let's get going. Thank you, Janelle, for your uh, sneeze blessing. Um, all right. This, uh, go back to my syllabus to, to uh, talk about what we're going to talk about this afternoon in general. Okay, this afternoon we are going to talk about um, the whole issue of questioning the use of uh, psychopharmacology from different perspectives. Um, we're going to talk about pharmaceutical companies and we're going to talk about some legal aspects such as uh, malpractice liability and um, the treating therapist versus the expert witness testimony and legislative acts. Um, before we jump into that, I want to spend a little bit of review time, if I can, um, talking about the pregnancy ratings and the FDA pregnancy ratings. Because I messed that up when I presented it first to you. I did correct it, but I do want to emphasize the correction. Um, that <clears throat> between 1979 and 2015, the Food and Drug Administration had these lettered um, pregnancy categories, A through D, and also the letter X. And I had stated it incorrectly early, the earliest, and I wanted to reinforce the correction that the farther you went down the alphabet, the worse it got in terms of pregnancy risk. So D is worse than C is worse than B is worse than A, where A has no problems. The, um, and I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail in just a moment, but um, when the FDA decided in their wisdom in 2015, starting in 2016, to change, to get rid of these pregnancy risk categories and go to narrative, if you will, of uh, related to pregnancy and lactation information for specific drugs and doing away with the categories, these sort of artificial, arbitrary, cat, not arbitrary, but artificial categories from lowest to highest risk, A through D, they made it actually a little more confusing for us all in the current day and age. Nowadays, it's important to know your medications and know what general risk they are in pregnancy and lactation and reproductive potential for males and females for that medication. And you can't just say, oh, it's category A or it's category C and be confident. So there still will be people who will talk about category A, B, C, D and X and it's important to have a general familiarity with this, even though it's not the normal, it's not the current nomenclature, if you will. So, for example, I said that category A in the old categorization system was the cleanest, right? Adequate, well-controlled studies have failed to demonstrate a risk to the, fetus, to the fetus, either in the first trimester or after that. Okay. And category B was animal studies have failed to demonstrate any 
fetal abnormalities with animal studies, but there have been no adequate or well-controlled trials with humans. All right, but here's one that's kind of important. Abapentin, Neurontin, a anti-seizure medication that's prescribed fairly frequently for a variety of mental health symptoms, including mood instability, bipolar disorder, um, anxiety, PTSD. Um, it's an anti-seizure medication, so it sort of lowers down the, the electrical activity, if you will, in your brain and provide some level of calming anti-anxiety effect and some mood stabilization. Now, I have never been a fan of prescribing Neurontin for several reasons. One, I think it's dangerous and two, I think it doesn't work very well. So it's sort of a double whammy. So it violates the ethical standard of safe and effective. I don't think it's all that safe and I don't think it's all that effective. It's in the old style category C for pregnancy. And category C is animal studies have shown there is an adverse effect on fetuses, animals, but there are no adequate trials in humans. And so they suggest that potential benefits may warrant the use of the drug to, despite potential risks. Gabapentin, Neurontin is in that category, as is Trazodone and Des or Desiril is the trade name. Desiril and Trazodone is the name of the medication that is an antidepressant that is prescribed for sleep, taking advantage of its major side effect of sedation and tiredness. So it's fairly frequent in inpatient settings for medical people like surgeons and internists to prescribe trazodone, also for mental health prescribers to prescribe trazodone for sleep because it's non-addictive, not habit forming, right? So that's a good thing. Don't get, put them on a benzo like temazepam or Xanax or, or uh, Ativan or Clonopin because those are potentially dependency uh, producing uh, medications, but put them on trazodone. Well, trazodone is category C. So if a woman is pregnant, she should not be taking trazodone, but it's prescribed very freely with the thought that it's safe, but it's potentially unsafe for that developing fetus in the category C, whereas animal studies have shown fetal abnormalities, but the human studies haven't been done or they're not well controlled and, and high in studies. Um, no, you don't see any slides, Nina, because I don't have the slides on yet because we're talking just about pregnancy. If you wanted to go to a slide, it would, it would be the, um, slide 57, but actually I'll go to the slides now. There we are. Okay. And, um, oops, 57. Okay. 57. Um, but just a couple more words about this topic before we move on. Okay, there we are, slide 57. So we're back on this pregnancy and FDA indications regarding pregnancy risk. Okay, so I hope I've left you with the sobering thought that Neurontin or Gabapentin and Trazodone or Desiril, the trade name, for trazodone are, are the old fashioned category C pregnancy categories. Animal fetal abnormalities, 
but no human studies or well-controlled studies have been done. So be cautious. So if there's a pregnant woman, on the face of it, you should not prescribe or you should caution others if they're prescribing Neurontin or Trazodone for a pregnant woman. But remember the caveat that the benefit needs to outweigh the risk. So if that's the only medication that worked for that individual, even though they're pregnant, it may be worth considering. But I'd be hesitant doing it, and I would hope you would too also. Okay, moving on to an older category D, that's the most risk. That is, there is evidence of human fetal risk based on prior studies um, with these medications in category D, the old fashioned before 2015 category D. And these are the benzodiazepines. These are uh, Xanax, Clonopin, Ativan, so, and some other um, blood pressure and um, uh, medications, including lisinopril. So, if you're treating or involved in a team treating a pregnant woman, you would not want them to take a benzodiazepine because of demonstrated fetal abnormalities. However, they give you a caveat with that also, that perhaps the potential benefits may warrant the use in that pregnant woman, um, despite potential risks, but be super cautious about it. And then there was that category X, which is the category where medications were approved, but they're too risky in pregnancy. And some of those medications include um, some of the statin medications um, and uh, blood pressure medications and uh, blood thinner medications such as warfarin, which is the old fashioned rat poison, methyltrexate, which is used for rheumatoid arthritis and some cancer conditions, um, and that you would, um, the risks clearly outweigh the benefit. Now, thalidomide was never on a FDA list pregnancy or otherwise, because it was never approved, because it had not gone through the rigorous studies uh, for the United States, and therefore it was not approved, although it did slip in through the back door in some samples in some pregnant women who went overseas during the 60s in travel, like I mentioned. Okay. So I'm gonna conclude the issue of pregnancy and risk with the thought that the FDA is now looking at every medication specifically, not putting it into a category, except, um, I mean, not a, a, a lettered category, A through C, A through D rather, or X, but rather individualized to each medication based on its risk in pregnancy, its risk in lactation, breastfeeding, and its risk in reproductive uh, potential for the female and for the male. And that's what we have to live with. It's more honest, it's more complicated, it's more individualized, but it's better. All right. Now, moving on, we're now gonna get into some of the ethical dilemmas um, that we see in prescribing mental health medications. Um, 
We're going to look at some articles, but by the way, these articles are in your reference section. You're not going to be tested on them. Um, it's out of interest and completeness that I present this. And, and I think you'll find it just so interesting. I hope you will. But it's not something that is, um, you're necessarily going to be tested on at all. So if you want to go to the reference section, it's um, section 2.5, starting at 2.5, um, about 100 pages or so into the reference section. You can follow along with me. I'm just going to go through a number of articles that speak to these ethical dilemmas. OK, we've all pushed toward evidence-based treatments with psychopharmacology. And there is a, I hope you're getting uh, one of the overriding principles or overarching principles rather related to prescribing of mental health medications that there's just a relative lack of, of research, uh, few placebo controlled double blind studies, the gold standard of you know, clinical drug research for psychopharmacology. And people are often shooting from the hip, winging it using anecdotal evidence, like the president uses with chloroquine and uh, coronavirus. Anecdotal evidence is interesting and helpful, but it is not hard science per se. And we're always searching for evidence-based treatments. And coming up relatively short, I must say. So moving on to cosmetic psychopharmacology, what do I mean by that? That means, think of SSRIs, serotonin uh, selective reuptake inhibitors. We are looking at medications that help with feelings and thoughts and dealing with the world uh, to improve things, but aren't necessarily treating a frank anxiety disorder or depressive disorder. And SSRIs um, started becoming popular in the 90s. They started into effect in the late 80s, like 87. I think Prozac was 87, if I'm not mistaken. But in the 90s, they started being used for cosmetic psychopharmacology. Um, and it's a very gray area that's hard to quantify. I may have told you of the case, I can't quite recall now, six months ago, of a 40-year-old, um, approximately 40-year-old woman who was a recent widow. Her husband of approximately 15 years had committed suicide in a depressive episode. She had two children who at the time were 10 and 11 or, or 10 and 12 a boy and a girl, and she was in grief, as were the children. This was a unexpected suicide by the husband, at least unanticipated by the wife. And she was just, uh, the bottom fell out from under her. She isolated at home. She didn't want to go out. She was tearful. She was depressed, situationally depressed, but also you could say clinically depressed, right? And she was not functioning very well. And she came to see me. She was my very first uh, SSRI patient. And I think it was Prozac that I treated her with. And we were both rather shocked that within a week or two of starting on Prozac, she started acting a lot less depressed. And specifically, um, she decided 
inner wisdom to put on a a birthday party for her 12 year old daughter and invite 12 other kids and their mothers and her other parents to this birthday party. So a real big deal, a lot of work, preparation, et cetera, and a lot riding on it. And this was her first so-called coming out after the death of her husband, which had affected the whole community and everybody knew about. And so it was, uh, there was a lot at stake there. And she came back from that party saying that she was shocked at how well it went. She said, I was like a Stepford wife. I acted as though everything was okay and everything went fine during the party. Everyone had a good time. The kids were paid attention to. My daughter, you know, was thrilled with the whole thing and it was a real success. But she said, I felt so phony. I felt so cosmetic, if you will. I felt like I was a Stepford wife that was acting and I could sail through this, smile at the right times, laugh at the right times. And she said it felt very disconnected. Well, part of that was of course her psychology and her depression, sort of faking it till she made it. But part of it was the, in my opinion, the direct effect of the SSRIs. Um, and that's one of the dangers, of course, with children and adolescents who take SSRIs more than adults in that they can often get activated and make it appear as though they're not depressed, but still have the ideation, perhaps a suicidal or self-destructive ideation underneath. And that's why they need to be watched very carefully when they're first started on an SSRI. But she was, I wouldn't say that she was an absolute clean case of cosmetic psychopharmacology because she did have depressive features and anxious features related to the grief she was going through from her husband's suicide. But there was definitely a cosmetic aspect to this. And she, um, she, relished it, she benefited from it, but it also creeped her out at the same time. And it wasn't too long within months that she wanted to come off the Prozac, which she did successfully and did okay after that in just talking psychotherapy because it made her feel weird. It made her feel like she um, was acting. And so, Dr. Dr. Yes. Brady, I just want to let you know we're not seeing your slides. I didn't know if you intended us to be kind of oh. doing your slides at this point. I just want to let you know. Thank you. Um, let um, Aiden, if you're there, could you help me with this? Um, I thought my yes slides were there, but maybe they're not. I believe you haven't shared yet. Okay. So let me, oh, that's what the problem is, folks. I'm very sorry, here they are. Let's see if this works. How about that? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Sorry about that and thanks for bringing that up. Um, here I go merrily on my way and uh, I'll go to I think I'm going to go off um, video, but I'll of course stay on audio. Okay. I think we're at slide 58, folks. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. Ethical dilemmas. Okay, uh, chat, yes. Oh, I don't see the slides either. And that, that was part of the problem too. I'm sorry about that. I didn't have the chat room on. So now I'm plugged in again. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, looks like we're tuned in now. All right.
let me just say, see if there's anything else that I can pull from the references that I want to. Um, so what are, what are other aspects of so-called cosmetic psychopharmacology? What about um, jerkiness, being a jerk? Um, what about irritability? Um, reminds me of the family therapy I did where the wife said, Doc, you were successful in getting my husband off marijuana. Now get him back on it because he's such a jerk off it. He's irritable and cranky and um, I'd rather have him a little spacey and distant but friendlier. That would be cosmetic psychopharmacology with marijuana, in my opinion. Um, so for those folks that are more antisocial, um, who are more on the irritable side, um, you could make a case for so-called cosmetic psychopharmacology, but I hesitate in making that absolute because there are degrees of depression that have an irritable side to them. For some people's major depression, it manifests as irritability and sullenness and not necessarily melancholy or tearfulness, right? So we're getting into some gray areas and welcome to the world of psychopharmacology where you are often put in a position of vague diagnoses and vague um, symptoms to address with psychopharmacology. And it's often a hit or miss trial by error um, phenomenon. Um, I'll give you a, a concrete example um, from right now and my own um, uh, uh, group of friends have um, a friend in Southern California that has had bouts of depression. He's now 70 years old or 69 years old. And he was finding himself several months ago becoming irritable, cranky, withdrawn, and um, unpleasant to be around. And he said, I've been here before, I've done this before. I'm going to call my Kaiser primary care doc and see if I can get back on an SSRI, one that I took five or so years ago with a similar episode. But this time around, he had unusual side effects of a lot of tiredness and also body aches, et cetera, and excess sleep and listlessness and also nausea. And he said, this is too much trouble. Um, this is worse than the, the cure is worse than the disease. Um, I suggested he talk with his psychiatrist about cutting the dose down a lot. He did that, it didn't help. And so he went off it all together. And what I suggested to him as a friend more than anything was, you know what? I don't think you're a candidate right now for an SSRI. You could try another category of antidepressants such as Wellbutrin, but you tend to cycle out of these depressive episodes after a month or six weeks. You're already a month into it. How about giving yourself another couple of weeks and see if you cycle out of it and not need it at all. And that's exactly what he did and that's exactly what happened. So there's a lot of nuances involved in this. And he, he was better off taking no medication and just weathering through it. Um, by the way, he was hooked up with the Kaiser system, made it difficult to get psychotherapy and it was too much trouble, but he cycled out of it within several weeks after that anyway. Okay, uh, moving on in the references. Now I'm looking at an at a, a article. Uh, the number is 2.6 of medication development and testing in children and adolescents and its current problems that continue to this day that we have a dearth of psychopharmacologic research with children 
because as I said six months ago, who in their right mind as a parent would ever allow their kid to be in a placebo controlled double blind study for major depression as a, as a, as a child? Um, it just, parents don't do that. Kids don't go into these studies. And so um, there just is an inadequate amount of research with children and adolescents. And this is why the FDA has not approved anti many of the antidepressants for children and adolescents because they just haven't been studied in adolescents and children, but they're used all the time. They're used off label, right? Okay. And the same thing goes with placebo controls in clinical trials. If you're suffering with acute mental health symptoms, you're not gonna wanna be part of a study that gives placebo. By the way, placebo can be up to 25 to 33% of the effect uh, of a medication is just a belief that the medication is helpful and working. So it really confuses things. And uh, the use of placebo controls in clinical trials in mental health work is troublesome and oftentimes not definitive. So these are all sort of red flags, if you will. Okay. Now, the next slide has a bunch of articles that are right out of the references, and I'm gonna mention a couple of them. A couple of them are mine. And we're gonna talk about this for a little bit and flesh this out. Okay, let's take number two, exposing the myth makers. How, um, soft cell has replaced hard medicine. This was taken out of the networker, which is a, a guild journal for, in California for um, MFTs, master's level uh, counselors, marriage and family counselors. And no big surprise that they would be um, busting, if you will, the use of medications. And actually, it's a pretty well-written, if not biased, um, long article um, on the dangers of using psychopharmacology when talk therapy is really where it's at and what should be, what should be done goes into some detail of the amount of dollars, millions of dollars that pharmaceutical companies make off these medications, these prescriptions, how many billions of dollars is spent and what a racket it is um, to prescribe medications for these uh, conditions that otherwise would have been taken care of in talking therapy. And we know ourselves, other studies, such as the ones done on um, on um, panic disorder, that talk about how helpful supportive psychotherapy is and how SSRIs that are prescribed all the time for panic disorders, um, are no more effective than supportive therapy. However, think about our American culture and how we are, how we've been sold on, on the concept of uh, get it fixed fast, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, don't talk it through, take a pill and chill, um, conquer the West, um, solve problems in a quick fix way. That's our American ethic, if you will. 
So pharmacology, psychopharmacology fit, fits in beautifully with, with this Western ethic of fix it, fix it now, and better to take a pill, frankly, right? So you don't need to at all, but I encourage you to look at this article um, and get some of the um, concepts down, which I'm trying to impart on the dangers of leaping to pharmacology when supportive cognitive behavioral and other th therapies can be extremely helpful and life transforming in a way that a pill never will, never could, right? Um, one of the questions this article asks is, is the beneficial effect a placebo effect or is it real? It's a good question that cannot be answered. Um, and they also have a nice little section at the end of this article on following the money. If you look at consumer-based mental health um, support groups, such as the National Depressive Manic Depressive Association, um, Anxiety Disorders Association of America, these are organizations that are actually in some ways thought of as front organizations by the pharmaceutical industry. Just as you'll see ads on television for the coal and um, oil petroleum industry that is that looks like it's all about consumer protection and support when actually they're front organizations supported by the petroleum industry and the coal industry to make it, to make the public, to dull the public into minimizing the problems of these fossil fuels. The same thing happens in the pharmaceutical industry with pushing um, uh, funding for so-called consumer groups that just happen to advocate for the use of medications. It's real, it's nefarious, and so follow the money. If I can get anything across to you in this weekend's course, it's to be skeptical and be suspicious. I'm sorry to do this to you, but be suspicious with regard to psychopharmacology of who's Where's the money and follow the money? Who's funding this? So I've gone through 30 plus years of going to psychiatric conventions and conferences that have in the past been much more blatantly and heavily sponsored for, um, by the pharmaceutical industry, proselytizing doctors and nurses other prescribers giving free stuff. And I'm gonna show that to you um, maybe this afternoon. I've got a box of freebie stuff that I've collected over the years from uh, drug companies in bringing me presents and, and all. Um, the bad old days are not there anymore in terms of the blatant um, um, bribery is the only way to put it. I've had pharmaceutical reps come to me when they've had a newer medication that came out, often a Me Too medication that's similar to the old one, but the old one went off patent, so they're not able to you know, make the profits that they did before, it's now generic. So they'll repurpose it, repackage it, reformulate it, adding a, um, a you know, chemical to the formula to make it uh, s different, but also similar in terms of effectiveness. And they'll come to me as a private psychiatrist and say, we would like to pay you 
they don't say it this directly, but this is what it comes down to. We would like, we feel so enthusiastic about our new medication and it, we hope to persuade you to feel enthusiastic about it also, that we would like to pay you thousands of dollars to promote it among your colleagues because you're a very trusted, high integrity psychiatrist. And if it come, if the information comes from you, it will be more believable to your colleagues and they will prescribe more of it. I have never gone for any of these um, selling jobs ever. From the beginning, I knew it was sleazy and bogus, but many of my colleagues did. And I have been invited, I never took advantage of any of them, to ski trips, you know, paid weekends, ski trips, etc by the pharmaceutical company where you would show up for an hour during the whole three-day weekend of lift tickets and hotels and and car expenses and food etc to um, go to a lecture and that would make it deductible and um, part of business and your job was to go to your colleagues so i have had colleagues of mine who i actually respected even a training director back in the old day who would call me up and invite me to have conversations with them about this newer medication or meet with them over dinner, paid dinner, to discuss the details of the latest research on this newest medication. Never accepted any of these. I always thought they were sleazy. However, there was a time in my child and adolescent leadership days when I would promote um, raising money from them for our conferences. And they would, of course, insist on a booth at the conference and pushing their wares and their, and their freebies, which I'll show you later. And I've raised upwards of $12,000 one year for the child and adolescent psychiatry group it really gave me a bad taste in my mouth to do that. It's what everybody did. And I realized pretty quickly that that's not what I wanted to do. And I stopped doing it after that first year. Um, kind of turned on them. Um, so you have to be suspicious of the so-called consumer groups especially the nationally led ones that are slick and have great web pages and see who funds them because they're often funded by the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so is it unethical to receive a gift from a pharmaceutical company? The answer is it's increasingly thought of as unethical. They have clamped down on it substantially. Um, the newer drug reps are not allowed to bring you a gift of anything of more value than say $10, $15. In the old days, um, I stopped this right away too, but for a while there I would accept it because I was a caffeine addict that they'd bring me a cup of uh, Pete's coffee or Starbucks coffee on the way to the office. Hey doc, I'm on my way, I'm stopping at Starbucks. Can I bring you a latte? I'd say, sure. Well, pretty quickly I realized that that was selling my soul even in a minor way and I stopped doing that. And at first I made excuses about, no, I've just had enough coffee or I'm caffeinated enough, thank you very much. I wouldn't confront them. And then later, as I got bolder and more tuned into what I thought was going on, I'd say, no, that doesn't feel right. And then I stopped seeing them all together, saying, send me, you have an article you want me to see, send it to me. That was about at the time when the pharmaceutical reps started getting, I think that what tipped the balance they started using higher pressure selling tactics, like before they left the office, almost with their foot in the doorway, keeping me from shutting the door, they'd say, 
So based on our discussion today, Doc, does it sound like you feel comfortable prescribing medication X for all your patients with depression and anxiety? I mean, they would actually say that to me. And at that point, it became real clear to me that this was um, not right. And I stopped doing it, stopped seeing them. Okay. Now, um, bullet point number three, Citizens Commission on Human Rights, Scientology. CCHR, Citizens Commission on Human Rights. It sounds really good, right? On the face of it, Citizens Commission on Human Rights. I've talked a little bit about the history of Scientology. I have to be careful about this. Um, I do believe Scientology is a cult and that they're only a IRS designated religion because of their nefarious ways with the federal government where they sued um, the IRS so many times that the IRS um, finally threw in the towel and said, if you stop suing us, we'll call you a religion. And now it's an official tax deductible or uh, tax um, avoidant religion, if you will. And uh, you may know the story of L. Ron Hubbard, the head of Scientology, the inventor of it, if you will, and his e-meter, which was a mechanical device, electrical device, to um, look at your electrical activity and determine uh, mental health issues um, stress, anxiety, depression, etc. Um, L. Ron Hubbard had uh, tried to uh, present his premise at different psychiatric society conferences and was essentially thrown out, uh, not accepted. They said, you're crazy and you're a cult and this is not science it's hocus focus hocus focus um l ron hubbard who probably had a diagnosis of very high functioning paranoid schizophrenia then uh, made it his life's mission to attack psychiatry and the mental health system in general, kind of sour grapes, it seems, and label every psychiatrist essentially a murderer. So part of your homework assignments, if you will, not tested or anything like that, no grade involved in this, just out of interest, is to go on the web and and go on, uh, look up the Citizens Commission on Human Rights, and you will find a wealth of information, all cult-like biased, that has the common theme as follows. Uh, Johnny was prescribed Prozac at age six. At age 13, Johnny murdered his family. Prozac kills. That's the theme of everything in the Citizens Commission on Human Rights. Um, their belief system is that um, oh here's a here's one. Um, Ron Matthews, age 14, beat a classmate to death with a bat in the woods near his home in Canton, Massachusetts. Though Rod was extremely bright, he was put on Ritalin when he was in the third grade. Ritalin kills. Um, their belief is that psychiatrists and other prescribers 
of mental health medications actually are murderers and rapists and child molesters and that this is just one of their means of getting kids under control under their control to abuse they believe that psychiatrists should be locked up yeah it sounded like johnny needed an rtc yeah there you go um uh, their belief is that psychiatrists should be locked up and the, thrown away the key as child abusers and molesters. Their belief is that all psychiatric medications are straitjackets for people. Um, and will destroy your mind will cause schizophrenia, will cause depression, um, will cause bipolar disorder. Um, so when I was uh, new in practice, maybe a year into practice after my child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship, I got a call from some representatives in San Francisco for CCHR, and they were the most pleasant, um, sweet people saying, we'd like to help you in your practice of treating children, and we'd like to meet with you and the rest. I said, well, send me some literature. I, you know, I'm pretty busy. I don't meet with just anybody. Um, I'm too busy. Um, why don't you send me some stuff? So they sent me some stuff. I checked it out. I talked with friends and, the, and I realized it was Scientology. So the next time they called, I said, you know, you guys, you, it would have been nicer or more honest if you just said you were Scientology. And I'm aware of Scientology's antipathy towards psychiatry and the rest. And they basically flipped on me on the phone and said, you're a child molester, you're a murderer, and you'll pay in hell and all this. And so... I said, I've got to go. I've got to hang up the phone. Um, but it was very creepy and kind of scary, too. Um, Cult-like in that sense. Um, OK. The Dark Side of Psychiatric Drugs is another article from years ago that uh, from USA Today that um, talks about um, the researchers who have made it their life mission to badmouth psychopharmacology and have done anecdotal or otherwise, you know, um, unscientific studies um, toward um, the bad things that can occur with psychiatric medications. Now, I don't want to leave you with any thought that there is not some degree of validity to their concerns. Um, I think they're real. Um, and let's move on in some of these articles and I'll, I'll demonstrate that. But let's take a quick break. I see that it's 1.54. And so let's meet at four minutes after after our 10 minute break and we'll continue talking about questioning the use of psychopharmacology a very important topic all right so talk to you in 10. again um it's about 204 and um we'll continue talking about questioning the use of psychopharmacology. I do really want to spend the sufficient amount of time on this topic in this course, uh, in this degree program, because to my mind, we need to give enough attention to the problems of prescribing mental health medication as the solutions. Uh, 
and to have us be skeptical, conservative, cautious about the prescribing of medications to one's uh, mental health that can transform their lives in a negative way um, as well as in a positive way. And this requires a good amount of uh, detail and reflection. And when in doubt, remember the ethical standard, do no harm and don't do it. So um, a couple more things about Citizens Commission on Human Rights. I pulled these out during the break of some points I wanted to raise. Um, according to Scientology, psychiatrists commit 40% of all medical fraud. I don't know where they came up with this. Um, did you know, according to Scientology, that four out of 10 women on psychiatric inpatient wards are raped while they're in, in hospital? Um, in all my years of working in inpatient um, psychiatric hospitals, uh, there's not been one case that I can remember of a rape or near rape. There have been assaults, uh, men against women, women against men, men against men, women against women, but there have not been rapes. Here's a question Scientology likes to ask. Who is most likely to addict children, drug dealers or psychiatrists? And their answer is psychiatrists. Who is most likely to assault children? Psychiatrists. This is the byline, if you will, of Scientology. And it's not a uh, reasonable discussion or um, articulate science-based argument. It is cult. Okay. Um, I recommend you take a look at uh, an article, but I won't go into it in detail. Um, the Dark Side of Psychiatric Drugs uh, from USA Today many years ago. One thing I will talk about with this article is that it did speak to a problem, and we'll talk about it more with Thomas Saz in the next article, that existed for decades, probably until the 70s or even 80, 1980s, where if, and, it, and it's reflected in Hollywood and movies, Snake Pit and others, these private sanitariums, where if you, and, and film noir movies, if you had a troublesome wife, if you had someone in your family that you wanted to get rid of, you would call up your family doctor and get them hospitalized in a private psych psychiatric sanitarium where they would be drugged up, um, maybe lobotomy, electroconvulsive therapy, et cetera, to calm them down. And this was done, if you recall, from one of the um, John F. Kennedy's sisters by the father, unbeknownst to the uh, mother, Rose. I can't, was it Rosemary? Um, the uh, John Kennedy's, uh, JFK's sister, who was put in a institution and given a lobotomy to quiet her down. Yeah, made her worse. Um, and uh, to calm her. And if you've ever heard about lobotomies, it's pretty grotesque. You put an ice pick up their nose and swirl it around in their frontal lobes, causing extensive brain damage and turning them into essentially a vegetable um, for the rest of their lives. Not cognitive, not a human anymore. All right. 
One of the other reference articles that I put in the reference section are two book reports that I wrote actually for my economics class as part of my um, MBA. And you can see the date, September 2001, October 2001. That was um, right at 9-11, right? Um, I was interested um, in my economics class on mental health issues. And the, um, these were extra credit book reports that I wrote. These books had been sitting on my, in my bookcase for years. Um, the Myth of Mental Illness by Thomas Saz and Against Therapy by Jeffrey Masson, who was the um, psychoanalytic archivist for the Freud Institute. Um, and Thomas Saz was a Canadian psychiatrist who took on the issue of um, how mental health patients back in the 40s and 50s were warehoused, something like a half a million Americans were warehoused in state hospitals, mental hospitals and sanit private sanitariums because they were too troublesome as family members and they were just locked away with the key thrown away. And he was addressing that and good for him that he did that. He went off the deep end a bit and I'll talk about that a little bit, but his initial premise was a valid one and actually was the precursor to the whole patient's rights movement of right to refuse treatment, right to refuse medication. And I recommend these two book reports to you they're fun reading. It was fun to write way back when. And just to go through it a little bit, um, Thomas Saz did not think that mental illness was real. He thought it was a metaphor um, for life's problems. Um, he distinguished between um, so-called organic mental conditions and psychologically based mental conditions and said that psychologically based mental conditions had no business being treated and in the uh, realm of psychiatry and certainly not warehoused, etc. cetera. Um, He went into a whole theory about a systematic theory of personal conduct. Um, and he talked about how psychoanalysis was essentially bullshit, which I can, I can understand and um, actually sympathize with. Uh, part of my trouble in becoming a, an, a beginning psychiatrist was that most of my supervisors were analysts and they were all odd ducks socially. They were, they were probably on the spectrum, if you will. Um, we talked about with the autism spectrum disorders, they were socially inept um, and had steel trap minds for details, often photographic memories, and, and would recite chapter and verse on psychoanalytic theory. If you ever challenged them, they would call it resistance. They had a whole system of discounting you. And I remember painfully being in the audience of a number of psychoanalytic forums where they would pit one trainee against another trainee with a couple of supervising analysts in between the referee. And it would be like a um, modern day, um, you know, fake wrestling fight where they would trash, um, they would trash each other in unmerciful fashion. It was painful to watch, all to make a psychoanalytic point. 
Um, and I thought it was cruel and pathetic and just hated it, hated going to these seminars. Um, the good thing about Thomas Sass is that he helped expose the bad side of psychiatry to the world and that we were warehousing people for bad behaviors, for inconvenient behaviors. Um, I took strong issue with him when it came to his whole paradigm because I thought he went off the deep end with it. I grew up, as I've mentioned before, with an older brother who had severe mental illness, psycho psychotic, aggressive, um, mood disordered, um, talking a mile a minute, racing mind, brain on fire, not sleeping for days and weeks at a time. And he would, Thomas Saz would call this um, just a uh, behavior problem. And that's what my father concluded too, and would try to beat my brother into um, wellness. Well, it didn't work, it just made things worse. Uh, my brother's mental illness was real. It came from the family. My father's sister was this way, and we had ideas that his mother was this way, although she abandoned the family when she was in her early 20s, when my father was just five years old. Um, so anyway, I'd, I'd, I'd uh, love it if you, if you read these, the myth of mental illness, took the good out of it that it helped clear out the mental hospitals for better, for worse, um, actually for worse in a lot of ways because these folks are now our homeless population uh, with uh, upwards of 50 plus percent of people homeless having s significant mental health issues that before were taken care of in a uh, caretaker sort of benign but neglectful and often abusive manner behind closed doors and behind the, you know, hidden from the public. So it's a real mixed bag. Um, against therapy, Jeffrey Masson. Jeffrey Masson is a brilliant guy, um, clinical psychologist who was the head of the Freud archives. And he had a bone to pick against psychiatry and Freud and made a strong thesis against the idea of therapy. And he, he uh, cherry picked in his argument. He brought up all the real problems in the field and used it to discount pretty much everything. Um, so, Masson attacks just about everybody and everything. He attacks feminist theory. Um, he attacks uh, Carl Jung and Jungian analysis, analytic psychology, etc., and throws it all out. Which I think is useful, but it only goes part way. That's too broad brush. And um, it seems like Jeffrey Masson also was kind of sour grapes. He was considered to be a failed um, psychotherapist himself, never actually was successful in his treatment of patients. Um, had become initially seduced into psychoanalytic theory only later to feel betrayed by it. Um, and I conclude by saying he's kind of a troublemaker. But 
it's very useful, I think, to, to uh, build the case against the overarching problems of mental health treatment at that time and psychiatry specifically. So psychiatry has charged forward over the years, pushing medications, um, prescribing off-label, um, getting in bed with the pharmaceutical industry, having their meetings and, and groups essentially paid for by um, pharmaceutical industry. I mean, it was, it was, I still cringe at this, that we had liver rounds when we were residents. Liver rounds were the pharmaceutical rep would bring in pizza and beer or wine on a Friday afternoon and we'd have a pizza party at the hospital um, funded by the pharmaceutical company. Um, and if that didn't influence us and have us not think about what we were doing and why we were doing it, why we were prescribing, listening to our supervisors who were hook, line, and sinker with it, I don't know what would. Um, so, This brings us to um, the whole question of can psychiatry be a science and or is it more based on a cult or on um, an overlying cultural phenomenon to justify our and lend, lend credence to our uh, Western ethic of conquer the West and civilize the heathens, etc. So I found this a particularly interesting kind of cultural analysis of what's wrong in the prescribing world with regard to mental health medication and recommend you take a look in all your spare time without being graded on it um, with some of these reference articles. Okay, that brings me to um, the last article, The Americanization of Mental Illness. Actually, it's a book uh, by Ethan Waters, 2010. That is just fascinating. And there's a article from the New York Times Magazine that, um, is in the reference section to describe it for you. And I highly recommend, it's just fascinating reading. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples to illustrate the point. Ethan Waters is a uh, investigative journalist who takes on different industries and um, brings to light their um, problems. And this is one on uh, the pharmaceutical industry and mental illness. Uh, I invited him to a child psychiatry conference one year and he gave the most fascinating presentation on this um, and the audience was wrapped and it um, was really a success. His whole point, just as America has colonized the world in its particularly American way of doing it, um, promoting wars, deposing uh, democratically elected leaders, uh, and focusing on marketing and selling of American products and goods, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, et cetera, around the world, not necessarily colonizing countries the way uh, Europe has done, uh, Great Britain most notably, uh, but also Germany and Portugal and, and uh, uh, Belgium with the Congo, et cetera, some egregious, egregious actions on the part of these first world countries toward the colonized countries of slavery, mutilations, um, particularly 
vivid in Congo with um, chopping off Belgian soldiers and their uh, native um, tribesmen working for them, chopping off limbs of uh, people, um, children particularly, hands and feet um, in the early 1900s, just the most gory pictures you've ever seen. Um, okay, I'm going to do a quick aside. Um, Eddie asks, were you required to study psychoanalysis in your training? Yes, I was. Um, and, uh, but it was already moving away from, the field was already moving away from psychoanalysis being the be all and end all when I was in training. So I had a hybrid program. All of my established supervisors and even training directors were analysts. And it became um, uh, pretty clear to me early on that they were biased and old fashioned and even dangerous. And so I sought out supervisors on my own often outside the Institute and got the Institute to pay for them of more enlightened um, uh, psychiatrists and even psychologists who were had different paradigms such as family therapy, strategic family therapy. I did an elective with that with a local psychologist at another hospital. And I went to see a um, uh, retired psychiatrist, Otto Will, who um, his whole career was at um, Shepherd Pratt if I'm not mistaken, or was it Austin Riggs? Now I forget, one of the psychoanalytic institutes on the East Coast, but he was a very practical, he sort of said, throw out everything you've ever learned about psychoanalysis and do what's working and what's practical and uh, m incredible mentor and teacher of mine. Um, and Jason says, there was an article I wrote in the American Psychiatric Association's publication that psychiatric training spends too much time focusing on therapeutic interventions and needs to put significantly more emphasis on neurology. Do you see the field of psychiatry? Oh, yes. Uh, psychiatry is definitely moving more toward um, uh, away from, uh, well, in two parts, it's good and bad. Uh, it's a moving away from therapeutic interventions so it's moving away from some of the newer stuff like cognitive behavior therapy and dialectical behavior therapy and more towards um, neurology, as you say, and organic illness and defining it by, you know, functional MRI, et cetera. Um, I had the opportunity a couple months ago of meeting with a uh, training director of a child and adolescent uh, fellowship program in Southern California. And I was talking with them about cognitive behavior therapy and dialectical behavior therapy, and he knew very little about it and was not very interested in it at all. And it was clear that he was imparting that to his trainees um, and uh, not a practical world um, in, my, in my way of thinking. So yeah, I do see problems there. And I do see opportunities for psychologists who are who are thoughtful and comprehensive and interested in prescribing to fill in some voids there. Does Masson mention the DSM in his work? I don't recall that he did, but I, I'm not sure. I would doubt it, but I'm not sure. Um, so back to Ethan Waters. Um, so for example, one of his topics in his book, The Americanization of Mental Illness, is eating disorders in Hong Kong. And at that time in Hong Kong, this is before, this was in the 90s, before uh, the uh, mainland China took over the governing of Hong Kong in what was that, 99 or 98? Um, 
there were very few eating disorder patients and they were um, pretty classic DSM uh, diagnoses with anorexia nervosa. Um, the, uh, the, the concept of, of the more newer concept, if you will, of, of eating disorders as a psychiatric condition uh, was introduced and it took off like wildfire. So the thinner you could get, the skinnier the model, the teenage girl in the, in the magazines, et cetera, the skinnier she was became more and more appealing. And there became sort of a Western view, if you will, of eating disorders and it took off uh, like a plague. Another example was depression, a more classic example was depression in Japan. Depression in Japan has always been there. There's been sort of a societal um, acknowledgement and acceptance of um, suicide, Harry Carey and, um, and uh, ceremonial killing of yourself if you are disgraced or defeated like in World War II the generals, et cetera, would kill themselves. And uh, so there's always been this um, depression in exam. It's called Kokoro no Kazi, a cold of the soul. Well, um, starting in the 90s and into the 2000s, American pharmaceutical companies started moving into Japan and selling SSRIs and turning this into an industry. <laughs> um, selling millions of dollars of uh, pharmaceuticals, having these folks um, have this, you know, switch to this clinical definition of you, if you will, of depression away from cold of the soul and uh, making for many, many more individuals with um, depression. Another example is the um, is Zanzibar off the east coast of southern Africa, the island of Zanzibar. At that time, back, back then, if you had someone in your family who was psychotic, um, they were a little bit like the Greeks thought of mental illness. They were a little bit closer to the gods. They were kind of special in the family. They were taken care of behind closed doors and accepted by the community as an oddball, but generally accepted and, um, and uh, taken care of. Well, then the pharmaceutical industry of America came into Zanzibar and said, no, these are psychotic individuals with schizophrenia and they need antipsychotic medication. And it just, it wrecked everything. These folks were now stigmatized with this Western thing of mental illness, put on medication with its side effects and potential problems, et cetera. They were ostracized by the family. They then became homeless and adrift and would die and um, the whole societal um, support and management of these mentally ill people went by the wayside. Thank you to American pharmacology. So Ethan Waters' point to all of this is that by exporting our Western notions of DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and medications to address these serious mental illness problems has distorted societies, um, stigmatized individuals and families, <coughs> and um, made a ton of money. 
for the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so I guess the punchline here is that we have to guard against um, this occurring and this tendency to have this Western ethic of quick fix, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, take a pill and chill, conquer the West with our kind of oppressive notions of the way it is, discarding, distorting local culture, cultural mores, cultural norms, and uh, it, can, it can result in disaster um, and make a lot of money for some people, some companies. You know, it's funny. Um, I have a number of colleagues who over the years have gone overseas to the Middle East, to Vietnam and uh, South, Southeast Asia to help them set up their mental health systems, their addiction treatment systems, et cetera. And although I've been somewhat curious about these um, ventures, and I've even been invited um, to come along a couple times. I've always resisted it, and I haven't always, I wasn't always clear on why I was resisting it. But in thinking back about it, one of my resistances is just this notion of the Americanization of mental illness that we as Americans are pushy people around the world. We have exploited the world, its resources, its people for our own ends, to sell products, to market, to sell Coca-Cola. Um, and I have always been hesitant and humble about going along with this and Every time I've brought up some concerns or worries, don't you worry that you might be um, distorting the situation and you might be introducing things that aren't actually there, that are not problems, that you're creating problems and the rest. I would carefully in society meetings venture into these discussions tentatively. I wasn't sure of my own thoughts about it. It just didn't feel right but I would always be shut down by the powers that be and the leadership of the uh, professional societies, et cetera, that were mostly analysts saying, oh, you're resisting or you just don't understand or are you up to this? That was the famous um, put down is, are you up to the work? Um, this is what I was handed as a child when my older brother had his first psychotic break and in the 1960s as a teenager and a pretty smart teenager, if I do say so myself, saw what was happening to him in the system and how, although he was, they tried to help him and he was helped at times, overall, um, they tried to put him into a box, a metaphorical box, and label him and blame everybody. Blame my parents, blame him. Um, and uh, if he wasn't getting better, it's because he didn't have enough willpower and it had nothing to do with their crappy medications, Thorazine, Milleril with the intense side effects, overwhelming side effects and mind dulling aspects to them. It had to do with, um, if he didn't succeed, it was, it was the fault of others. It wasn't their fault, it wasn't their medication, it wasn't their treatment, it wasn't their approach, it wasn't their diagnosis. It was um, not up to the struggle, not up to it. And I think that that really sort of in the crucible of my upbringing put me in a place where 
I had to challenge that, but I could only challenge it, frankly, from the inside, or at least more effectively challenge it from the inside. And uh, I think part of it had to do with uh, being a, a being homosexual, because the psychiatric um, way of thinking about that was that it was a mental illness, and. I knew in my heart of hearts that wasn't true. It didn't make sense to me, um, but that's what was sold. And uh, so I knew kind of at an early age that there were real problems with this field. And it, there were some good aspects to it. Yes, people were warehoused against you know their will and lobotomized and, and that need to, needed to stop. Um, but it didn't need to be replaced by overwhelming medications that would do the same thing, but in a um, more palatable way. I want to get off my soapbox a little bit with that, but I did want to get across um, in this afternoon session some of these thoughts of be skeptical about medication be thoughtful about culture. Um, be really cognizant of this idea of do no harm. And am I making this decision uh, for clean motives or for bias motives? We're all biased, but at least be aware of your biases. Okay. Um, I don't want to get on a soapbox about this topic, but I think it's important, especially in this course, this weekend, to reflect on the field as a whole and where we've come from and where we're heading to. And I see dangers ahead, um, but I also see good things happening too and a more thoughtful, um, integrated approach that combines good um, therapizing with good medications. And again, medications helping to stabilize the system to make use of the good therapizing, the good socialization, the good developmental tracks that you want people to be on, etc. It's complicated. All right, is there anything more to say about those two articles uh, before we move on? Doctor, would it be okay if I run the poll at this time? Sure, good minutes. idea. Yeah, please do. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I think what I'd like to do at this point is we're gonna take a break in five minutes anyway. I think I'd like to ask that we take the break after the polling for attendance right now. And then we'll come back for our final hour and talk about the pharmaceutical companies and their influence on prescribing. And I'm going to show you my gift bag of goodies, so to speak. And um, we'll finish the afternoon um, with that. So let's take a 15-minute uh, break from uh, 2.45 to 3 p.m. Um,
Pacific time. And the last hour we'll spend on the pharmaceutical industry and its um, power and largesse. Okay, thank you. Started for our final hour um, of Saturday afternoon. Um, Robert uh, Smith, you wrote me a, a private message. I'm happy to have you uh, talk about it um, to the class if you're interested in doing so and uh, respect it if you don't want to. Either way you want to go is fine with me. All right. Um, so we're going to finish this afternoon on talking a little bit more about the um, pharmaceutical industry and the um, and my gift bag, if you will. And then we're going to finish on some um, medical legal aspects, expert witness, uh, malpractice, things like that related to psychopharmacology. Tomorrow we'll start on um, medical records and charts and, and prescription writing and documentation and electronic medical records and all that good stuff along with practice guidelines and algorithms, decision trees, um, and get into more detail about cultural issues. Um, patient formularies and their rationale and the whole legal business about right to refuse medication, um, et cetera. All right. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Great, thank you. Uh, and let's get started, okay. So we're still on um, slide 60 and let's move on to a pharmaceutical company influence in prescribing. I've talked around this quite a bit and this is the kind of the final slide on the topic that captures it. As I've said before, uh, gifts from pharmaceutical representatives are increasingly considered unethical um, on the other hand, um, there's a lot of shaving that goes on. Um, what I mean by that is that uh, pharmaceutical reps are now prohibited from giving large amounts of money or gifts. They're not prohibit prohibited from giving small amounts of gifts, um, such as a Starbucks coffee, et cetera, um, in order to be friendly right, quote unquote. Um, it's always, I think um, one of the sort of lasting points I wanna leave you with, with the pharmaceutical industry is follow the money. And if somebody offers you something for free, there's usually strings attached. Nothing is for free, right? They want something. They want your loyalty, they want your trust, they want your buy-in, they want your acceptance, they want your lack of criticism. Um, they're buying something when they give you something and you're selling it. So the more clear you get on that, the more skeptical <coughs> you, will, you will be. Um, I personally think it's a, a kind of a scandal to have pharmaceutical advertising on television. They're talking about complex medications for complex medical problems, often uh, rare uh, cancers and chronic medical conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, et cetera. And they're offering um, pretty uh, amazing medications, the whole new biologics that, that boost your immune system to fight against um, these chronic conditions is pretty amazing. Uh, 
and uh, valuable. Is it valuable to the extent that they're charging? Um, it doesn't appear so because the profit margin for the pharmaceutical industry is uh, some of the highest of any industries um, and uh, often double what other industries are. They spend more money for marketing than they do for research and they often co-op research from government funded sources and make sweetheart deals with professors and academics, other academics who have a hand in uh, the private company. And um, there's um, dangers in all of that. Um, I've talked a little bit in the past about um, the, uh, the people who come to your office, the pharmaceutical reps. Um, one of them is stereotyped very well in the old Big Bang Theory series on TV with Penny. Remember, she was a pharmaceutical rep and um, she's pretty, she's blonde, she's um, uh, uh, sexy and uh, she makes a good pharmaceutical rep. It's been my experience that uh, pharmaceutical reps are sort of like athletes. They, um, their time runs out when they're in their mid thirties. Um, they're no longer as attractive and charismatic. Um, and uh, there's something very ego stimulating uh, and rewarding to have a couple of um, beautiful young women or young men come to your office and um, sell you. Um, it uh, feels a little bit akin to sex um, and uh, their outfits, their hairstyles, their, their makeup, their um, uh, etc. is all intended to be attractive and sell. Um, and they, uh, they often um, get, uh, I don't know if you know this, but the pharmaceutical industry has access to pharmacies and prescribing such that they know if you are prescribing their medication that's part of their due diligence before they come into your office. They know how much of the particular medication that they're selling is uh, that you're writing prescriptions for. And so if you ever lied to them and said, I'm prescribing more than, you know, than I am, they would find that out. Um, so it's kind of creepy when they start letting their hair down and telling you some of these details of uh, manipulation. Uh, they have you totally sized up before they see you and they know what sells to you and what you're attracted to. And um, if you're not cautious and thoughtful and a bit anti-authority, you're liable to go along with it because they're selling and um, you're buying. Um, I mentioned the uh, conferences that has been a big boondoggle and, uh, and also their funding of so-called uh, consumer groups um, that appear on the face of it to be true consumer groups when they're actually 98% funded by a pharmaceutical industry, just as some of the consumer groups around energy are funded by the um, fossil fuel industry um, and the um, uh, coal and, and natural gas and petroleum industries. So whenever you come across a consumer group or something, um, be skeptical and check out who is providing their funding. And you'll find it's often in this regard, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, uh, 
All right. Um, let's let's shift. I'm going to shift to the camera because I want to show you my my treats. So have to go to the video camera on, and I'm going to minimize this slide um, if I can. Uh, come on. Um, Wait, 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 okay, we got that. Um, folks, I'm just figuring out how to, Aiden, if you're there and could help, I would appreciate it. I'm trying to get to my, um, I can see that I'm on stop video and I can see that I'm off mute, but I can't, can you guys see me? Yeah, um, doctor, um, you need to unshare your slides before you want to go share okay. your other stuff. And also when you go to the share button, at the, at the bottom of that uh, page at the window, yeah. you need to choose the option that says um, share the sound, share the computer sounds as well. Oh, okay. Share sound. And how about optimize for full screen video or is that different? Well, you haven't uh, you haven't uh, unshare your current uh, PowerPoint. So let me. Uh, so do I go to to to? Okay, I'll. Uh, there I am sharing again. Um, we'll get it. Hang on, folks. Um, share for computer sound, and I don't go to whiteboard. I don't. Oh, maybe I go to screen. Just see what that does. No, that didn't do it either. I'm sorry, folks. Let me just try to. Okay. So, um, let me just try to see if I can uh, stop your sharing for now okay. from here. Let me see if I can stop the sharing from here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there you I go. I stopped your sharing. Now, if you again uh, go to your. Uh, share right and now choose that video and also when you do that at the bottom of this window that is open on the on the left bottom corner you see there is a somewhere that says share computer sound yes okay let me see uh, you might as well choose the optimizer screen sharing for video clip okay all right Click those options and then choose your video. Yeah. Right, right. No, I'm not going to leave the meeting. Okay. Um, okay. Folks, I'm not doing it. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not able to figure out how to do this. I still have my slides up and I can't get rid of it. Um, let's see. Show video panel, maybe that. Yeah, okay. It makes me pretty small, but um, is that big enough for people to see? We still just see your uh, Zoom background. Okay. Spotlight video, pin video. No. Uh, how disappointing! I can't. I can't figure out how to do this. And, would you uh, like to? Would you like to send that video to me, and I share it for you? I I don't know how to do that. I can, I'll aid. Okay. In that case, uh, again, let me unshare your background again. Let me unshare you, and okay. this time around. Um, if your video is on, is it on the YouTube or is it on the video uh, player? I don't have a video. What I want is just the camera. I just want my computer to show me. Um, yeah, we are seeing you. We are seeing you. 
Are you? Yeah, yeah. I am seeing you right now. Okay. But I'm seeing everybody. I mean, I'm seeing everybody's name. Are you just seeing me in a little tiny thumbnail or are you seeing me full screen? No, I, I see you. I see you big on the screen. Okay. Then if you do, then everyone else does. And that's what I care about. So that's great. Okay. It isn't the same for mine, but that's fine. All I care about is what you guys see. Okay, so over my travels over the years, I've collected a box of, and I'll start with the more benign stuff, but all of it is towards selling. So we're very familiar with, um, especially with coronavirus, CNN's Sanjay Gupta, I don't know if you can see that well enough, but this is Sanjay Gupta has done a educational program for a uh, continuing medical education company. And this one is called Evidence-Based Treatment Options to Maximize Patient Outcomes, um, Dispelling the Myths of Glucose Abnormalities, Weight Gain, and Lipids in Psychiatric Populations sponsored by Lilly. Now, um, this um, video or CD from an unrestricted educational grant from Eli Lilly is all about um, antipsychotic medication and uh, Risperdal and uh, Sanjay Gupta is educating us on how Risperdal is the best medication, uh, Risperdal, um, for uh, preventing um, weight gain, et cetera. All right. Um, here's another one by the same CME company um, by a Dr. Jonald uh, Koshes, K-O-S-H-E-S, on successful strategies for rapid control and long-term maintenance of patients with psychosis, sponsored by Lilly. So Lilly and other pharmaceutical companies um, pays for doctors to give presentations. And they also, I have been asked to do this, and I've been sent a draft set of slides that essentially does it all for you. In other words, they do the lecture for you. It's their slides and it's pretty slick stuff, good marketing, good graphics. And all you have to do is put your name on it. Um, it sounds pretty compelling. Um, in the older days with VCR tapes, um, these are uh, VCR tapes, this one is sponsored by Zyprexa, the beginning of hope for patients with bipolar mania. Um, so this would be an excellent educational video for, and it's, co it's hosted by actor Peter Bogdanovich for bipolar disorder and Zyprexa. So you can see how Hollywood is in on this also. And um, uh, using their trust, if you will, to promote um, ideas about their, about medications and specifically the medications that they pay for. Now, you go into a doctor's office and they often have a clock on their desk. This is my um, Zoloff clock. It's pretty kind of cool, a little bit um, mid-modern um, clock. By the way, I've never had any of these devices in my office. They immediately went into a box. Um, but you can imagine if you're a patient or a family coming in and you see my Zoloff clock, that it's going to make you feel a little bit warm and fuzzy about um, Zoloft and that Dr. Brady endorses this, right? So here's my Paxil clock. Um, 
and it's uh, paroxetine HCL controlled release tablets. And it even has a timer on it for a 15 minute session, a 45 minute session and a 60 minute session. So you'd get a little buzz, a little uh, alarm to say, oh, you're finished with your medication management patient. Now, if that weren't enough, um, we have little uh, white pads. This is from um, Zyprexa, excuse me, Effexor, uh, Venlafaxine. So you can imagine writing a little note, your next appointment is at this time on your Effexor uh, pad. You have just endorsed Effexor in the mind of the uh, patient. Here's my Paxil pad of uh, white paper. Okay. Um, now, one of the selling points of Effexor is that it is dual diagnosis, meaning uh, not dual diagnosis, it's dual effect of a serotonergic, noradrenergic antidepressant. So it has more action, so to speak. So this is my um, Effexor coffee cup in its nice little colorful box. And no big surprise, the cup is one third larger than normal because it's one third more effective, right? Everything is marketing. I've never taken that out of the cellophane. Um, all right. Um, everybody likes coffee, right? So here is the um, my Lexapro high-end um, coffee mug, thermal mug that's uh, Lexapro and uh, made in China. And, you know, I don't know how much this cost originally, but it'd be 15 bucks, $20, something like that for the coffee mug. All right. Just to make sure that we're getting across the marketing, this is my Lexapro mouse, computer mouse with its specific to Lexapro design little, little um, floaty thing. Um, this is my Lexapro stapler, right? And this is my Lexapro that has a magnet on the back that could fit on the side of a file cabinet or something with all sorts of useful things um, having to do with calendars and reminders. And you can even program this to alert you to the end of a psychotherapy session. All right. Or, so we saw the Lexapro uh, mouse pad, excuse me, mouse. This is the Lexapro mouse pad um, that your mouse would work on. Can you imagine in your office using these brand name pharmaceutical things and it's done all the time? Well, one of the biggest treats for your office staff is microwave popcorn. So here is your Risperdal um, Risperidone popcorn uh, to be used in the staff room microwave oven. Staff love this. Best way to sell a doctor is to sell the staff. Get them on your side. Now you have a number of offices that are occupied or empty. And this is one of these hotel type things occupied or available with Paxil on it, Paxil CR, contained release. 
um, or controlled release rather, um, to put on the doorknob to let you know that this office is occupied or available. So imagine yourself walking down the hallway in your therapy uh, clinic and seeing which Paxil placard is, you know, office is occupied or um, available. Now, this is my favorite in a kind of a crazy way, but it's missing something. This is my Viagra clock. Well, what's missing is Viagra, if you remember about Viagra, it has a four hour um, action, if you will, time of action. And so it had a transparent blue pie shaped um, area that you would put that you would put on the clock in order to let you know that that four hours was you needed to have some action um, in the bedroom um, during that four hour uh, period. So that is your um, Viagra uh, clock. Unfortunately, it's missing that pie shaped piece. And uh, give me just a moment. My uh, two Labrador retrievers have decided that it's time for them to come in and they just pop their way in. So I have to get rid of them. Hang on just one second. One of my dogs has the amazing ability of um, uh, flipping the door handle to any room and uh, letting himself in and the other Labrador retriever who's not as smart just follows along. So I have to warn house guests at times that they may get a visit in the middle of the night unintended. All right, um, I'm gonna shift back to uh, slides and <laughs> Joy, my dogs have decided it's playtime, so it's World War III with toys. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, do the drug companies even bother pursuing prescribing psychologists? Well, get ready, folks. If you get to be a big enough number, they will be after you because you will be a, a source of revenue for them. Um, and uh, so, uh, Consider yourself lucky. Um, there's an evolution that I went through with the uh, pharmaceutical companies that at first in my naivete and youth, I was flattered by their interest. And it took me a couple of years to figure out how I was selling my soul. And uh, so at the beginning, it was quite, you know, uh, it started in medical school. Um, and uh, they would, uh, I mean, they would bring us freebie stuff in medical school as medical students. It starts the proselytizing and the uh, manipulation starts at the earliest of stages as a medical student where they give you freebies and uh, are helpful to you. Yeah, I just got a steak dinner from Vivitrol last month. Exactly. This is, you know, um, it's quite calculated and quite Machiavellian if you think about it, that they get you early when you're young and naive and green and insecure and they lock you in. Um, and I'm sure they have profiles on you behind the scenes. Um, but, and it takes a few years to, um, if they give me food, I'm sold. Yep, there you go, Jason. Um, yeah, and it's the dinners at Roots Chris. And when you deny yourself these things, you're also telling your colleagues that they are selling out. And so it makes you feel bad when you, you know, your, your friend in the office is going to this Vivitrol dinner and you're not going. Um, and it's like, uh, you're, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, 
I just ask you to think twice and four times about this, be cautious and, um, and realize that, that, there's, that there's nothing in life that's free. There's always a price to pay. Um, and it takes a few years to figure that out. All right. Um, let's shift back to slides. Let me see how I can do that. I'm going to stop video and uh, let's see. I'm going to share back to slides. There we go. Great. Okay. And now we're going to finish our discussion on some uh, legal issues, etc. And by the way, let's just talk about educational grants and Speakers Bureau just for a moment. Remember I said that they'll give you $2,000. Gee, Dr. Brady, you're terrific and you're quite a public speaker and and uh, by the way, you're kind of good looking too, right? Uh, used to be. And uh, so we'd like to pay for your time. It's valuable time. You have valuable things to say. It's all ego soothing and, and uh, oh, we'll help you out with some slides. Oh yeah, you're really busy. You don't have time to put together a slideshow. We'll do it for you. And, uh, but you, of course you check it and make sure that you agree with it and all like that. They'll make it so easy for you and they won't pay you an outrageous amount of money. They won't pay you $10,000 to do it, but they'll pay you $2,000 to do it. And that's, you know, that's pretty good money and entertaining and all like that. Um, it's, it's very seductive, very seductive. And you're the leader among your peers. And um, it's really, um, yeah, so they are hiring. I got student loans to pay. So are they hiring, Joy? Yeah, I mean, it's, I've had uh, colleagues go, um, one in particular I'm thinking of, started with a pharmaceutical company right out of residency and uh, he's never left. And uh, uh, he's had a whole different career. Um, it's, um, it's, and what's your approach for providers that work primarily in telehealth? Well, yeah, I, it's the same, sure. They still prescribe, sure, it wouldn't be any different. Just, you know, just be skeptical about all of this. Um, we can't get away from it, it's America, um, it's what we do, but we have to, we have ethical standards that, that require us to do no harm, to do good, to be honest, to be trustworthy, to be responsible, to not sell out. And so you're always in that crucible. Okay. So let's go back to, um, I wanna go to the slideshow. Okay. All right, medical malpractice, this is what we're gonna finish up with. Um, and the expert witness testimony business. I've mentioned before a number of times that if it isn't documented, it didn't happen. And in a court of law, if it's not documented, you're screwed. Um, you should just settle and get out as cheaply as you can and look, look at it as a life lesson. If you document well, and you document your line of thinking, your reason for using an off-label medication, your reason for using that dosage, your documentation of side effects, your assessment of risk, even if you're wrong, and you were wrong in your judgment about risk and they committed suicide or attempted suicide, um, or overdosed, uh, et cetera, in a suicide attempt, you will, um, and I, no guarantees in life, and I'm knocking on wood when I say this, but you will not be found in fault because you 
assess the situation. You don't have to be right in your assessment. You just have to document your um, line of thinking. So that's the final point. Fault found in lack of assessment rather than poor judgment. If you did not document, the assumption is you did not assess. That's what it all comes down to. Follow up, frequent follow up assessments, jot down notes, keep, keep on the medical record. And remember that in medical malpractice, it's a so called jury of your peers. However, it really isn't because it's lay people in the jury and uh, there is a sense that um, depending on how the case is spun the um, best story wins the most articulate story wins the prettiest people win um, if you're a cranky crabby doc who is resentful about being dragged into court it will jeopardize your chances of success in this trial. So you have to be articulate, you have to be thoughtful, and you have to have documented well. And you also need a number of peers who um, gave, who give expert witness that you did the right thing. Um, So um, I have a case to tell you about. I think I may have told you about it six months ago with the child and adolescent because it's a young adult. But um, with that um, caveat, let me remind you because it was a really good case. Um, this was when I worked for an insurance company as a regional medical director, had to talk with a, a doc who had been sued for medical malpractice and try to understand whether or not this doc um, strayed beyond the community standard of care such that he should be kicked off the insurance panel. And he told me the following story. He had settled a case. I can't remember for how much money, but it was um, a couple hundred thousand dollars of his medical malpractice insurance. So he didn't have to pay out of pocket himself. And it was revolved around a 19 year old young woman who had lithium toxicity and um, had some uh, paralysis issues um, related to lithium toxicity. He had been seeing her as an outpatient. He asked her to come in for sessions uh, to check on her, get her lithium level. She kept blowing him off, kept delaying, kept stalling, kept, and he kept prescribing lithium. She ended up having too high of a lithium level and neurologic complications that revolt, resulted in um, paralysis. I can't remember the degree of her paralysis. I have seen people with complete paralysis with lithium. I've seen, I've heard of people with, who have died on lithium. Um, and I've heard, um, I once um, did weekend call um, seeing a um, young woman with, in a wheelchair in the hospital who made a, a suicide attempt who had um, overdosed on lithium and caused uh, paraplegia. So this doc said um, he kept prescribing it. He kept um, sending her to the lab to get lab work for her lithium level, which she never followed up on. And that resulted in her continuing to take lithium at too high of a dose and, and it wasn't a huge dose. She didn't overdose. She was just on a um, higher level than the um, 1.2. It used to be 1.5 um, milli equivalents per liter, but now it's 1.2. They brought it down to be safer. It's a very toxic medication that it, and if it's safely prescribed, it works wonderfully but it has a number of potential problems, including thyroid dysfunction, et cetera, hypothyroidism. And she ended up with some degree of paralysis and sued in medical malpractice. And, the, and the, um, he had to settle for several hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I said, did you learn something? Would you do it differently if you did it again? And he said, I never would have continued prescribing lithium 
after she stopped getting the blood levels, um, I would have called her up and I would have said to her, I can't, it's not safe to continue prescribing while I can't check your lithium level. And that would have been that. Okay. So other legal aspects. Treating therapist versus expert witness testimony. Um, so a legal expert witness testifies regarding in a medical malpractice case regarding an untoward event, usually a suicide or homicide, and whether the community standard of care was breached by the psychopharmacologic medicine prescriber. And I mentioned before that failure to examine the patient is a reason to lose the case. Documentation deficiencies are a reason to lose the case as implication that um, there was failure to assess. So, um, we all know that the treating therapist versus the expert witness, um, the treating therapist values a therapeutic alliance more than objectivity or candor. Um, this puts them in a bind if they are ever subpoenaed to, first, you would not voluntarily go to testify, but if you were subpoenaed by the court, uh, you have to go. And it's, it's very difficult for the therapist um, because frankly, the therapeutic alliance and the aim of the therapy of establishing trust, et cetera, reduces the therapist's objectivity. Um, so conversely, evaluators or expert witnesses find it difficult to respond therapeutically to the subjects of their evaluations. Um, neutrality and objectivity mitigate against therapeutic alliances. It's very difficult for a patient to meet with an expert witness because their job is not to be therapeutic or nice or the job of the evaluator, it's, it's to be objective. And that may actually rule against the patient. So it's the rare therapist who can respond simultaneously and effectively to both therapeutic and evaluative responsibilities. It's really hard to do both. Um, and you can, if you ignore these limitations, you can find it difficult. Um, you're, you're caught in a dual relationship. You are automatically caught in the dual relationship of an expert objective evaluator and the treating therapist. Now, unfortunately, this is done all the time and it is fraught with problems. So there's nothing, let me get this straight. There's nothing wrong um, for a treating therapist to testify as a fact witness um, and, but you have to clearly recognize the limit of your testimony as a result of your therapeutic role. When you're asked to express an opinion directly related to the legal matter at hand, the treating therapists are obligated to acknowledge their limitations. It always reminds me of one of my most favorite patients in terms of everything I learned this woman I saw for 15 years with schizoaffective disorder, who early on when she was trying to establish some trust with me, having worked with a ton of therapists and been untrusting, um, she would set me up and become angry with me when she said, you don't believe me, do you? When I say that I was sexually abused by my mother and I would say something like, everything you said points to the truth of that. But was I there? No. Do I know it happened? Absolutely 100%? No. Do I believe you? 
yes. Would I testify in a court that you were sexually abused? I don't know. Because I wasn't there. And she had the biggest trouble with that for years. And finally, later she came you know, back to me when we were talking about things, sort of reflecting back. And she said, you were honest with me and I appreciated that. How else could you have said it? How else could you have thought about it? Okay. Um, so it seems surprising, but it's true that most therapists do not carefully consider the inevitable conflicts uh, between an expert witness and a treating therapist. And they might naively go into a court setting thinking they could pull this off, maintain the therapeutic alliance and somehow have credibility in the court. Um, so it is true in order to establish a therapeutic alliance that the treating therapist generally accepts the reality of the, presence, the, the patient's presentation and historical narrative. Um, after all, we're not lie detectors. We're not in the business of doing detective work. All right. Um, so whenever a patient is being sent for psychological treatment by a lawyer and the treating psychologist is then asked to be a witness in the patient's litigation, these types of referrals are frequently made and not always for contrived reasons. A lawyer may see genuine, genuine emotional distress that is in need of attention independent of the lawsuit. However, this is where the greatest number of conflicts arise and where objectivity suffers the most. There's always bias in every opinion and every testimony. It goes for both treating psychologists as well as independent expert psychologists. Bias can come from basic philosophical positions or, or allegiance to a theoretical stance. And money too affects objectivity. So there always will be an inclination to provide favorable opinions to whoever is hiring the expert. That's human nature. That's how you get more business from that attorney, more referrals, is to tell them what they want and to say it on the witness stand in a credible manner and tell a good story that will sell the judge and or the jury. One of the organizations that I've been involved with over the years is called the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law. It's sort of the guild organization for forensic psychiatrists and it's also um, there for psychologists too. And one of their statements is that um, the treater should avoid agreeing to be an expert witness or perform evaluations of their own patients for legal purposes. This does not mean that there could not be instances where the treating treater provides important information to the court as witnesses, as fact witnesses, but they should realize the limitations of their testimony and the effect on their therapeutic alliance. In most cases, for their own protection and that of their patient, they, su su they should suggest that an independent expert psychologist be used to, um, to whom the records and observations can be provided to separate it out. Okay. I don't think I told you about this case from my own practice. It was when I was a trainee and I took this very much to heart, this idea of separating out legal versus therapeutic. And I had an extremely difficult adult patient with a um, malignant narcissism uh, diagnosis, very bright. And she kept be getting fired from jobs because she kept getting into fights with her bosses saying, you don't know what you're doing. I know what's going on and I know the right way to do this. And she would be so offensive and um, rude that they would fire her. 
and she really had trouble holding down a job. It was legitimate. So she wanted to go out on psychiatric disability. And she asked me to sign off on a psychiatric disability and I was her treating therapist. I talked to my supervisor. He said, don't do this in a million years. Send her to one of your resident colleagues. I was a adult resident at that time and have that person evaluate her for um, disability, keep it separate, keep the so-called legal and separate from the therapeutic. So I did that thinking naively that um, it would go smoothly. Well, the, um, my colleague that she went to, he was kind of a difficult guy anyway and didn't put up with too much and certainly was easily annoyed and she annoyed him and because she was annoying. And he said to her, I don't think you qualify for a psychiatric disability. So go back and see Dr. Brady and work out the, you know, work it out with him. Um, and uh, she came back to me and just cursed me out left and right. Um, she was, uh, I remember that well, it's one of these PTSD type things where she was screaming at me at the top of her lungs so loudly that the security guard had his hand, he told me later, on the door handle waiting for me to yell for help. And he would burst into the office with his master key instantaneously and save me from her. That's how bad it was. Well, needless to say, it ruined the therapeutic alliance. She fired me as a therapist, came back to see me later in private practice, fired me again. Um, I should have known better than to accept her back into my practice but there was something about her that I felt sorry for her and felt, you know, she was really smart and she just had a really bad break in life, but um, I was naive. It didn't work out. Um, okay, Jason, I ran into uh, that as an expert witness commenting on the psychologist treating and evaluating the patient for damages in a civil lit litigation case and the attorney's response we do it all the time because there's not too many psychologies willing to do legal work. Exactly right. You make do. If you didn't do it, no one's going to do it. But this is shark infested territory and be aware of the dangers of doing it and that it often doesn't work out and it ruins the therapeutic relationship with the patient. Um, so um, good point. All right. Um, one more point and then we're going to have a, a non-graded question and then we're going to end for the day. Um, okay. Occasionally state governments and federal governments will give edicts to uh, prescribers and professionals. The latest one that I can recall is there was a case 15 years ago, maybe in California, where an elderly woman who was terminal with terminal cancer was insufficiently medicated with pain medication such that she suffered quite a bit in the hospital. This was in the Kaiser system in Northern California. The family, she died of the terminal condition. The family sued for medical malpractice and won the suit because the doctor's attitude was, I didn't want to get her hooked on pain meds. Well, give me a break. She was dying. Um, she needed the pain meds. She needed comfort care. It didn't matter whether she became dependent or addicted to the medication. That was just stupid on the prescriber's part. So, in its wisdom, the state of California legislature passed a law that said all physicians in California must attend eight hours minimum of uh, pain management instruction so that this never happens to another patient again. And so I did mine through a CD uh, continuing education thing. I remember doing it in the car on my way to and from work and then passing an exam and sending it into the state, state medical board to prove that I had done this. It was a one-shot deal. 
And this is what happens when things get out of whack and the public rears its head and says, that's not right. Doctors should be prohibited from doing that or should be educated. And so you'll have an edict that will require you to do this. Well, I found it interesting and, and, and uh, educational, so I didn't complain. Um, I can't remember what the expense was, but it was reasonable. Okay, question 13, we'll end this for the day. Um, in a legal proceeding, a clinical psychologist who is the treating therapist may be called to testify about his or her patient. What ethical issues may arise regarding the roles of, of the treating therapist and expert witness or evaluator? A, the treating therapist uh, tends to value a therapeutic alliance more than objectivity, neutrality, and candor. That sounds pretty reasonable. Expert witness or evaluators are never biased based on agency. That is, who, pay, who is the agent who pays, uh, who is, whose agent is the psychologist, who's paying? Well, anytime you ever see a question, especially a multiple quite choice question that says never biased, that rejected out of hand. That's an old medical school trick. Never, always, those are rejected questions. C, treating therapists may testify as a fact witness, but should recognize the limits of their testimony as a result of the, their therapeutic role. And the answer is D, you got it all, A and D, okay? So the punchline of that question is we are all biased and that's okay, we're human beings. We should recognize our biases and take them into account in order to be honest and do no harm. So with that, are there any final finals before we finish this section? We've got a minute or two um, that you wanna bring up. Tomorrow, we're gonna do a whole different topic of charts, documentation, um, uh, uh, decision trees, clinical guidelines, algorithms, um, the right to refuse medication, and some of the court history that goes that backs that up um, nationally and in some states. Um, it's an extension of the whole civil rights struggle. It's actually a fascinating story. I think you'll be entertained. And then we're gonna finish the day talking about culture, talking about um, interpersonal relations between prescribers and other professionals and in the impaired professional. And uh, so seeing no um, comments, questions, et cetera, how are we all doing? Uh, are we all surviving this? I know we're all kind of distracted, um, but is this going okay? Haven't died yet. <laughs> good. Still safe. Excellent. All right. Well, um, you all have a good um, evening. And uh, we'll start up again at 9 a.m. Pacific time on Sunday morning. And I look forward to it. And be safe and uh, wear your masks. Okay. Take care, all, everyone.